So uh, as Mina, Mina said, we need we are going to talk mainly about relatively technical stuff uh, today. Uh, so the two other uh, speakers for today, we're going to so where we're going, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, quickly Palo IT, uh, the lab, the technical architecture, low power range and protocols. We already went through that, so it's just going to be a refresher from from uh, last. Uh, uh, so uh, from last uh, webinar, then we're going to talk specifically about uh, LoRa itself. So we're going to talk about LoRa, LoRa one, and so on. And then uh, we'll go through farm beads, how we ingest data, uh, the device conflicts that we've seen, a few pitfalls, conservation, and then the questions are going to be at the end. Um, Voila. So uh, Palo IT, what what do we do? So we are in the business of innovation and transformation. Um, voila. Our vision is to harness the power of technology for the greater good. Um, and that means for us that uh, this kind of uh, project that we are doing uh, with UNDP, with farms and so on, uh, are aligned with our, with our vision. And uh, we are uh, B Corp certified, which is a way for us to show uh, that we actually commit to these kind of uh, values. Uh, so who am I? Uh, so my name is uh, Dimitri Beklish. I'm the uh, CTO for Singapore. I have 19 years of professional IT experience. I worked with FSI and a few other industries. Um, and uh, I'm leading the Palo IT Impact Lab. And I have a very strong interest, among other stuff, in IoT and innovation. The second speaker, which is going to uh, join us, is Prabha Karan. Prabha? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Prabha Karan. Um, I'm a software engineer at Palo IT. I have over nine years of experience uh, across all uh, fintech industry. So I worked extensively in uh, um, wealth management. So basically now I'm working more on the Palo IT Impact Lab. So I'm passionate to coding and uh, specialties like Azure AWS. Yeah, happy to connect with you all. And uh, we're also going to have Puneet with us. Um, hi, um, uh, greetings of the day to everyone. You probably have people from across different geographies. Uh, my name is Puneet. Uh, I am a CA program manager with the Azure Global Engineering Team. Uh, I am based out of uh, Hyderabad in India. Um, I'm, uh, our team uh, primarily is, has the responsibility of building platforms for over 20 industry verticals. Uh, agriculture is one of them. Um, and my role is to manage customer and partner engagements uh, for the platform that we have built for agriculture, uh, which is known as Azure Farm Beats. And uh, happy to see and partner with Follow IT. Um, and happy to be presenting here today. Along with them. Thank you, Puneet. Uh, so a, a quick word about the Palo IT Lab. Uh, so, so a quick refresher. So we are uh, in the Palo IT Lab, we're doing uh, projects which are of short durations, two to three months. Uh, it's a tech for good project. It's a small team that is changed every time we have a new lab. We need to focus on innovative tech and new skills, uh, share as much as we can on the output and also on the journey. And we have to deliver a prototype, so something that actually works, not only a white paper. Quick reminder on the uh, architecture that we have at uh, Fair Farms. So it looks like this, right? So we have, um, we have uh, two greenhouses and uh, three sensors which are put into each uh, greenhouse. We have one external sensor, one ground sensors, five smart switches, etc. The goal being uh, for us to automate a greenhouse and to reduce the power and water consumption as much as possible. Um, so the low power edge that we're having, because we're going to be talking about that quite extensively. So we have four Raspberry Pi 4, four LoRa gateways. It's powered using solar panels and of course a battery because we need also to have data uh, during the night and we have also an inverter to provide the power. So how it's set up, we have two Raspberry Pis which are unencrypted, uh, which have an unencrypted LoRa gateway that are used to receive information from all the sensors. And we have two Raspberry Pi which have an encrypted LoRa gateway that we are using to send comment to smart switches. In terms of protocol, so same thing, quick, quick refresher. Um, the protocol that we are using is LoRa. 
right? Uh, LoRa has a broadcast type of architecture, which means that you can have multiple receivers for a single uh, sender of data. Uh, it's designed for IoT specifically. It's made for industrial use. Um, it's relatively cheap to implement. And it has very long battery life, so up to five years of battery life, and can have a range of up to five kilometers. We'll talk about the range in a few minutes. So first thing first, uh, there's a difference between LoRa and LoRa1. So what does that mean? LoRa is actually the protocol uh, which is the most basic, so the most low level kind of protocol. Uh, both of them, LoRa and LoRa1, are using the same modulation. The topology is a star or, um, or star of stars, which means that it's a single place which is broadcasting to a lot of other devices. It's not a one-to-one -one connection. The, both of them have the same uh, link layer, but LoRa does not provide the uh, top of the uh, OSI layers like the network layer, the protocol, the, uh, the, the, the internet connectivity uh, and the security. All of that is for you to, to design. It's not open source either. It's actually a technology which is uh, provided by Semtech and that technology you pay for it, uh, but you, you don't see it because it's basically paid by the people producing the hardware, so you don't actually see it. It's re relatively cheap to purchase and uh, also to use day to day because you don't have the internet connection. LoRaWAN on the other hand, so it's fully open source, uh, except for the part which is LoRa because LoRa relies on LoRaWAN. Um, it has session keys and a better security than, uh, than LoRa, uh, the way it's implemented. And it has also internet co connectivity using gateways. So, um, it really depends what you want to build and how you want to build it and uh, to, to, to make the selection between LoRa and LoRaWAN. So if we look at LoRa, why would you use LoRa? Uh, the first thing is if it's a, if it's a local network, uh, so you don't actually need internet or you don't have a, an internet connection, you want to, fo to focus on the link part, um, LoRa could be a good option. If you want to make it low cost, uh, no uh, internet mandatory, uh, and uh, also uh, you can purchase devices which are a bit cheaper. You focus on the communication link. Security is not critical. You don't need to have uh, specific session keys, for example. Um, you are okay with defining your own protocol uh, or using different kind of protocols in your, in your system. And uh, it's built to order. Uh, what does that mean? We're going to see it later, but there's different kind of uh, protocol uh, inside uh, LoRa, uh, different, different kind of decision that you need to make when you request for the device to be made. And this means that you are going to request the provider uh, to change these, uh, these parameters uh, before shipping the hardware. So it can have an impact on your timeline. If you use LoRa1, um, you would use LoRa1 if you are, uh, if you want to have an internet connection, if, if actually internet connection is one of the components in your system. Uh, you want interoperability between different providers without having to, to, to make the request to change the different uh, uh, protocol, the different hardware protocol. Um, you Okay, low cost is good, good to have, but uh, it's you, if you pay a little bit more, it's not a, it's not a big deal. You don't want to design a specific protocol yourself. Um, you want to use something which is already uh, designed for you. And uh, you have shorter timeline and you want to use build to stock. So build to stock means that it's a common protocol for everybody and you just have to pick it up. It's almost true. There's, there's a slight difference between continents and between regions because the frequencies are a bit different. So if we, if we do a, a deep dive first, we use LoRa, right? We don't use LoRa1. If we do a deep dive in LoRa, in terms of, protocol overview, uh, protocols, right? So LoRa uses frequency which are sub gigahertz radio frequency band. They're free band, so you can use it. it it's, uh, it doesn't cost anything, but they are different depending on the region. So Europe is uh, 868 megahertz, Australia is 915 and so on. So depending on uh, which place you want to do your implementation, you need to check what is the license free uh, radio frequency that you're supposed to use and ask your provider to, to uh, adhere to that. Um, 
Then you have 10 different channels in Asia. So depending on the frequency that you're going to have, the number of channels can be also a bit different. You have different types of bandwidth. Uh, so there are three bandwidth uh, available. 125 kilohertz, 250 and 500. You have also uh, the spreading factor, which is the duration of the chirp signal. signal. So it's between, uh, it's called SF7 to SF12, so it's a different uh, spreading factor. And then you have the data rate, which is dependent on the spreading factor. So when you select your spreading factor, you actually also select your data rate and you also select uh, the distance that you're going to have. So the longer spreading factor that you're going to have, uh, the lowest data rate and the longer distance, but also the more energy you're going to consume. There's also something that puzzled me for a while uh, is why in, in, in the protocol, which is the size of the packet that you're going to send, to send also depends on the, uh, the spreading factor that you're going to have and the distance. And in, in, in a normal networking environment, the further you are or the longer ping you have, the bigger the packet you want to have, right? So, so that you know that the response is going to come later and so on. So here is the opposite. So the longer you are, the, the longer distance you, 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 you want to send your data, the smallest the packet. Uh, so it's something that you need to take into account. Uh, keep in mind that if you need to send uh, data over a long distance, you're going to have an impact on your energy consumption and on your, um, on your data rate. Okay, so when you are discussing with your LoRa hardware provider, there are a few things that you need to ask. Right, so you need to ask the frequency. So for us, we ask the frequency which is good for Singapore and Cambodia, which is the Asia frequency, not the same as the Australia frequency. The bandwidth that we want to use, so we were at 125. The channel, so whether you're going to use one or multiple channels and then which channel you're going to use. The spreading factor, so same thing here, you see we selected the spreading factor of nine, which is between seven and 12 because we don't need super long distances. All of that is codified, so you can see what distance you're going to get. And we needed to have a longer battery, so we can select how far we want uh, the data to be sent. Then the application layer, uh, on the application layer, uh, we are using a serial port to transmit the data. And uh, we all only selected a certain type of data to be encrypted. The emission of the, uh, of the data, so for us, we selected five minutes, same thing. The more data you emit, the more battery you're going to consume, right? So if you want to have a, a longer battery life, you also can reduce the uh, data emission. And then the distance uh, that uh, you're going to be uh, to, 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 to want for your system. For us, we went for less than one kilometer. So now um, I'm going to talk, I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Punit to come forward for the uh, farm beats to explain what is farm beats and uh, what is uh, uh, the view that they have now and the roadmap for the future. So Punit, I'm going to give you the right to. Thanks, Dimitri. Uh, that's some good work that you've done. Yeah, I mean, would I have... You have the right to control the screen. It's with me? Okay. Yes. Right, so um, thank you for sharing uh, the work that you've done, uh, Dimitri. I'll quickly talk about Azure Farm Beats. Um, um, I've already introduced myself, so I'll not take much time. How do I move the slide? Uh, you, you need to click, I think, or arrow should work. To... Arrow? Um, Microsoft is... Uh, is, is a uniquely poised uh, uh, because the products or solutions that we're building uh, actually impact uh, millions of people across the globe. Um, and uh, that is probably the reason why we could put, uh, uh, you know, a mission statement as bold as this for empowering every person and every organization to achieve more. Um, and that's the idea. Um, uh, can we move to the Next slide, please. Uh, right, so um, no industry today um, is, uh, is not affected by the uh, industrial 4.0, uh, the revolution that is taking place, digital revolution. Uh, you know, businesses are getting transformed. Uh, agriculture cannot remain immune to it. Uh, the needs overall globally have, are going to increase. We'll have 
uh, to produce not only more food um, to feed the world, but also we'll have to figure out how do we produce that uh, in a sustainable and a scalable fashion. Uh, and how do we basically invest in those practices today uh, to be able to do that? And uh, the slide that you see now is basically uh, the sustainability of the United Nations uh, uh, you know, numbers in terms of what uh, are the challenges that we are facing today. Uh, there are many more challenges. This is just a sample set uh, uh, about 70% of the water uh, fresh water that is used uh, is for agriculture. We'll have to figure out a way how to conserve water, um, how to overall be more uh, you know, in terms of making sure we don't harm the planet anymore. Um, so I'm sorry, Brian. Um, it is estimated that um, Agriculture, uh, like you saw in the previous slide, is about 4.8 trillion industry. Um, and, and you, a lot of digital transformation is actually reimagining agribusiness too. Uh, we see newer opportunities emerging. Um, uh, only a few of them have been listed on this particular slide. The challenges that agriculture uh, actually has is some of the most complex problems to solve. Um, agriculture, as we all know, uh, depends on so many variables, uh, weather, soil, farm management practices, seeds, and what have you. Um, so uh, a solution that actually works, let's say, for uh, a one region uh, uh, to solve a particular agri problem uh, does not necessarily work uh, in another region. It could be in the same country or across the globe. So. Uh, Therefore, uh, we started with a research project. We called it uh, Farm Beats. Um, could we move to the next slide, please? Sorry, Dimitri. Azure Farm Beats basically started as a, as a research project uh, about three and a half years back. Uh, and uh, 16 months back, um, the Azure Global Engineering Team, that is our team, um, started building a commercially uh, available engineering product out of this. Um, uh, one of the pro biggest problem that we kind of, uh, we understood that agriculture faces today is um, since agriculture has depending, dependability on a bunch of uh, uh, you know, data sources, uh, these data sources are basically lying in silos. Um, and, and so the, the idea was to build a platform that could enable, uh, you know, seamless integration or aggregation of these data. Uh, and so that uh, it kind of helps not only uh, reduce the data processing costs um, uh, and also help uh, ag tech companies, those who are actually building solutions for digital agriculture, precision agriculture, can actually accelerate uh, their model building um, you know, opportunities. Um, so Farm Beats is basically currently available in public preview. Uh, that means anybody in the world, anywhere, can go ahead and, and, and install Farm Beats and start using it. Uh, all you have to go do is go to Azure Marketplace and uh, uh, and download and start using it. So Farm Beats is, is, is a you could say a, a, an analytics platform um, that has been built uh, for digital agriculture solutions um, without, uh, I would say, or with very minimal need to invest in deep data engineering resources. Um, yeah, and then this slide basically is a high-level um, architecture of farm beats. Um, uh, so you would basically uh, see at the bottom half uh, are all the uh, data sources that you would normally need. So the farm beats data hub, um, which is the base inside our Azure uh, cloud, uh, basically helps you acquire, aggregate, and process the agriculture data from different sources. It could be uh, sensors, uh, IoT devices, it could be drones, uh, and it could be cameras that you might have uh, on frame on your farms. And then you have the geospatial uh, data available via satellite, weather. And then we're also looking at how we could ingest uh, data from smart equipment as well. Um, once we ingest the data from different sources, um, you basic, FarmBeats basically helps uh, standardize the schemas 
uh, to query and reason um, through this data that we collect uh, from different sources in a very consistent way um, so that you're now able to kind of query this intelligently. Um, FarmBeats also helps you to fuse data between different sources um, and, and generate uh, insights uh, by, and therefore you could rapidly uh, train and build your AI ML models across these data sets. Um, next slide, please. Is this the space I because? Uh, yes. All right. So, um, like I mentioned, we've built a, a, a platform which is um, pretty horizontal. It helps, um, uh, you know, ag tech companies build their point solutions on top because we help in aggregating the data. Um, we will continue to invest in making this platform more and more intelligent, more and more capable. Um, some of the uh, you know, uh, innovations that we are currently working uh, on, uh, one is called the Space Eye. We all know how, how important satellite imagery is today um, and how much of insights that we can draw from satellite imagery for agriculture purposes. Uh, but we also have challenges around it. Uh, one is um, uh, you, you basically have very few satellites that actually cover the entire globe, um, but those who do, um, weather is, uh, is, uh, is also a problem uh, in terms of providing cloud cover and, and the shadows that cloud cover have. So the, imageries, uh, the images that the, the satellites provide uh, are actually uh, redundant in some time. So we are basically uh, building uh, a new set of uh, know, machine learning models that uses radar signals uh, that can penetrate through the clouds um, to, to kind of regenerate uh, uh, the farms that are located below these clouds. Now, uh, so you, what this uh, algorithm basically does is it combines the data from radar and the satellite and we cut some, so Dimitri, if you click, I think the video will play. Um, that this is basically a animated, yeah. So what you see on the left-hand side um, is basically a cloud covered image. Uh, and on the right hand side, uh, the image that you see is something that has been reconstructed using um, our solution, which is called Space Eye. Um, uh, we normally see that uh, a good percentage of images are lost because of cloud cover. So uh, the idea here is to make more and more, um, uh, you know, optimum use of these satellite images, irrespective of whether they have cloud or not, uh, to be more if, you know, effective in building your solutions. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? It's the Gaudi. Uh, another, yeah, the Gaudi thing. So another innovation that uh, we are working on is basically called Gaudi. Um, this basically is uh, uh, another, you know, uh, uh, opportunity for those who are building their point solutions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you have one um, solution that works in one region of the world, it uh, definitely may not be as sensitive or specific to the same crop uh, in other part of the world. So uh, this basically Gaudi kind of helps you with simulating or creating three simulations um, of your crop models. So kind of helps you uh, train your models for different changing uh, variable parameters across the uh, different regions. So that uh, now if you've already built a model, you really don't have to do too much of processing or engineering uh, for it to be more effective uh, across different regions. And um, so it could be different farms, different seasons, different uh, soil parameters or whatever. So Gaudi kind of helps to kind of fast track or accelerate your uh, scaling of your AI and ML models. Um, so this is just kind of a high level view of uh, what we are doing with FarmBeats. Uh, uh, if you have any questions around FarmBeats, uh, my alias is available. Uh, I'm more than happy to take that. Um, at this point of time, this is what I wanted to talk about Dimitri, and then I think Prabha will cover a few more aspects about how FarmBeats, uh, how Palo IT actually use FarmBeats. Thank you. Thank you, Neat. Uh, Prabhakaran, let me give you access. There you are. Okay. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, um, 
Okay. So uh, what I'm going to cover here, uh, it's about uh, Puneet. What Puneet was talking about, how our farm beat is offering to the world. So how we get benefit out of farm beats and what what we are using um, for in our lab. It, it's going to cover in the upcoming slides. Um, so can you move to the next slide? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. So there are a list of topics I'm going to cover here. Um, so the these are like why farm beats, and uh, what are the data sets we are going to gather for irrigation, and uh, what is the device partners uh, which farm beats has, and the implementation, and at last the the architecture. Okay, so why why we choose farm beats? So um, because uh, what Puneet said, so it's it's more uh, the farm beats offers solution to the agritech firms. So to collate and structure and process data. So these data, what we need, to, what we are going to use it, it's for the decision making. Uh, so we all talk about precision agriculture. So um, this is where the precision agriculture uh, gets speeded up, and uh, we we aggregate a certain specific form data, and we can ga gather insights from it, and we can use it for the machine learning model. So uh, that's where we we come in so we we learn about the machine learning model from the agriculture data and we use extensively across uh, our projects so on the third third point on extensibility um, we we have a, a tie up with uh, um, certain partners um, so microsoft one of the partner and uh, we, there are microsoft offers a solution across uh, different solution partners so if you look at the the partners at the next page, okay, I think I think the previous page. Sorry. Okay, so uh, there, there are there are partners which Microsoft is uh, um, offering. So um, which will be discussed in the next slide. So so um, we are going to uh, talk about the data sets we are going to gather for the irrigation. So there are a list of data sets we gather before we start the project. So. Uh, the data like sensors, devices, drones, and weather info. So the, these are the data which is available from a different source. And we, we gather all together and we build a, a machine learning model uh, out of these data. So how are we going to build a machine learning model is something which we are going to talk in the uh, next slides. Yeah. So so the, the farm beats have a device partner. So there are certain uh, partners they have a tie up with so uh, which they uh, stream provide a data streaming uh, by default so the partners like soil sensor drone weather and satellite they have the default partners from microsoft so uh, each say for example for dji so i uh, i i have a dji um, a drone and uh, where i snap a picture of the farm and upload it um, through their software and uh, we can directly we can we can start processing about the machine learning from from the particular image so likewise there are certain partners which comes with the package by microsoft which they they have already a tie up so um, so this set of partners which are open to public so we we, we can once we buy a, uh, buy a device from these partners we can straight away use use their device and and start taking uh, the reading from the from the sensors so what we uh, means we we have not utilized these these features because what we are doing going to do is something um, more inbuilt uh, at our own projects. So uh, what I am going to explain here is uh, there are there are a few. Um, so can you can you move that next slide? Yeah, uh, there are, there are um, few cost effective uh, solution we are trying to look out of the sensor. So if you are going to buy from uh, the the device partners we don't be getting the complete features and we 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 are more or less we we are paying extra cost to get the feature so um what are the built-in sensors we we are going to make it so it should be a lora compatible and it has to be extensive in integrating all our uh, supported device so next yeah so uh when when we ingest the data so uh, when, when we gather all the data from the data set so we, we are going to study how we are going to ingest in farm bits so there are there are steps we are going to follow 
to um, ingest the data to our Palo IT cloud. So these are the um, these are the set of partner credentials we require to generate out of the farm beats. So um, if you look at there are certain parameters like API endpoint, tenant ID, uh, client ID, and secret code, and even hub connection string, and all these parameters we need to uh, pass in to get the um, to get the query REST API query, and uh, we 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 get back the response from the uh, farm farm beats uh, with with the creation of a device and its uh, sensor. So there are two layers. Um, which uh, we, we are going to discuss um, in the farm base, like what Puneet mentioned, um, there is a data hub API and the farm base accelerator. So uh, the next slide. Yeah. So uh, the data hub is something which is designed as an API uh, layer. So uh, what we are doing here is we are aggregating all the agriculture data sets. And uh, we, we, are, we are actually um, having um, this layer as, as a Place where we ingest the data. So Swagger API is something which uh, Microsoft offers for us to for the documentation. So if you look at this, then it, it really helps to find the business logic of the of the farm beats, and we can straight away we can um, uh, look at the validation and static data and and, and start your projects with, within few few minutes. So uh, so basically, it speeds up the development time. And also, uh, we we understand the complete flow of what what the farm is really about. So, so uh, other resources like uh, yeah, previous. Also, some other resources like uh, database, even hub, and data factory are also exist in this data hub layer. So um, the, these are the resources which Microsoft uh, provide as a package. So what we are going to do is we are going to um, ingest the data uh, to this level. And we we build a query on top of it to get the data. So um, so in case of a database, Microsoft offers a Cosmos DB, and um, even Hub, the Microsoft offers uh, there is a pipeline data pipeline which uh, which Microsoft offers. So we can we can really um, you know bring in all the data into this pipeline, and and we can uh, gather uh, we can build our intelligent query on top of this. So next slide. And, and about the accelerator. So what, what we understand about the accelerator is something is a front-end UI. So um, we normally, we first what we did is we uh, sent in data to the farm bits and the data could be uh, either a device sensor or, or, um, or gateway nodes. And all, all these data we ingest. Before even ingest, we, we can create a farm using the boundaries first. And um, uh, what what we um, get out of this coordinates is there is there will be a logic behind which which pulls out all the satellite images and and we can download all the satellite images for our, all our machine learning model. So um, if you if you look at it, the, there are there are some coordinates we have we have marked it. So uh, if this particular coordinate uh, is part of uh, it belongs to the Cambodia farm. So we we. Uh, what we get out of this uh, coordinates is the satellite, and and we get some sensor um, suggestions also from from farm beats. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Uh, ingesting device data. So uh, what what we are um, what we have done is so we ingest the uh, information to the farm beats uh, through the data hub layer, and where we we uh, what are the things which are required to set up a, a farm network and and uh, put your, all your devices in the farm is something like a device model so device model is something which you you come up with the manufacturer uh, uh, the whatever the type and name of the um, device which is you you get it from when you purchase a device it, it, it is going to be there and you you just uh, you can upload upload it for directly from your side and uh, and devices which is corresponding uh, to the physical device which is linked to the device model uh, so the what we uh, pass is the the API query, uh, we, the post API which we pass and 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 immediately you can see the the devices is uh, in, uh, page and you know, devices included in the in the farm based UI. So yeah, 
if you see the next one, it's about the sensor error. So once you have a device, say the device, for example, if I see a device, you could say a Raspberry Pi or uh, something um, which is a gateway for the internet. You can have all your devices connected. Once the device is connected, you can have a sensor in place uh, in the, at the farm, say soil sensor. So once you have a soil sensor, then what, what, you, what you could uh, produce out of it is all the, the, the data which you gather from the soil. So here the sensor model is something which you have a the same like what would we have discussed about the uh, the device model. The same thing you you get the information of the sensor and and place it here, and and the sensor which is which is actually the the real sensor which you place on the farm. It starts uh, producing uh, broadcasting all the the readings about the data and you you can ingest it into the farm bits. So this is the sample uh, query which we have. Uh, um, passed to the farm bits and we, we, we are able to uh, add all the sensor details in, into the, the UI. Yeah. It's okay. So uh, um, so what what we have done uh, so far is, is we're able to load all the device sensors and the data. So uh, what we gather out of it is, is something a uh, graph. So that graph has a humidity or temperature. This is a, a sample graph where you have, you can see the humidity and temperature as shown here. So uh, we, we can visualize within the farm bits or if you feel like you want to have an even more detailed uh, visualization, you can, you can have a time series inside, which is part of the Azure Cloud subscription. So, um, so what, what we have come across so far, it's about gathering the data and uh, ingesting the data and, and what we achieve out of it. That's the question here. So we, uh, we, we have a farm network and we have a sensor gateway um, node and uh, database. So um, what we uh, do is we gather the sensor information and pass it to the cloud and we gather the drone information and put it in the cloud. And, and what we do, we, the, the cloud, what I mean here is the farm bits. So we have a data hub layer. So we pass it as a REST API. And from there you visualize in the accelerator. So it's, it's all in the Azure cloud. So, um, so what, what you have done um, here is, the, so if the farm network, whatever the information you pass in the farm network, it goes in the single pipeline. So again, there is another data you pass as a weather API into a second pipeline. And uh, we have a satellite images loaded in the third pipeline, and um, you, you gather all the um, information and, and pass it to the farm bits and as a single in a, uh, collated into a single pipeline. So once you gather all the data, so you are actually uh, having a visibility of complete data sets in, into the, onto the cloud. So you are going to get a full uh, advantage of what are the cloud facilities available. So from there. Or you are building an intelligent query uh, to get to understand the machine learning and you are able to pass it back to the farm network. The reason for we are passing back to the farm network is, is we, we need to have a certain set of data available in the local network so that we can take, a, um, can take the precision ag agriculture um, decisions so into the farm, farm network. So we, the ultimate goal of this is not to uh, load heavily into the farm network. We do most of the processing at the Azure cloud level and, and just the, the key the decisions and, and the key data sets are pushed to the farm network. So th this is the overall architecture we have. So, so, so we, what we get out of it is, is the machine learning uh, um, decisions which we use for the farm productivity. So that, that's all from my side, yeah. Thank you, Prabha. Uh, so one, one small thing, the, the restrictions that we have at the farm are still there, right? So we still have the same kind of restriction in terms of uh, network, yeah. connectivity, stability of the network and so on. So the discussion was actually whether we should get the data uh, that we have here, weather API, satellite data, uh, and whatever we can get from, from Azure back to, the, to, to, to yeah. the, the, the farm network, the farm cluster, or if we should do the processing somewhere else. And the reason why we decided to make it somewhere else is so that we can pass 
we can send, uh, you see, weather API is already coming from the web. Satellite is already coming from the, from the web, from the cloud, from different providers. Uh, the, the, the information that we have here from the sensors, we can send it in bulk. So it's, we can send the information in bulk. And for the information, which is um, uh, just uh, very recent, like the current, uh, the current moisture in the soil, uh, the current wind, because wind also has an impact, right? We cannot, uh, if we use uh, the, uh, the, the, the irrigation system, we're using uh, impact sprinklers. Impact sprinklers can be deviated from the wind. So if we have a, a high wind and so on, we, we, are not, uh, we are not able to water at the same time. And this information is actually kept at the, uh, at the farm level. So what we, what we do is we have a two layers kind of system. One system which is using machine learning in the cloud and providing insights, sending that these insights saying it's going to rain, it's not going to rain that much, not that much and so on, back to the farm. And at the farm, uh, the farm level, we take another decision, which is should we water and for how long? Right, based on the data that we have, which is the freshest water, or the freshest not water, the freshest data uh, set that we can have at the farm. So we have a two layers kind of uh, kind of system uh, to also uh, be sure that if we we don't have internet connection, nothing is piloted directly from the cloud. The cloud provides insight, but the final decision is taken at the farm and can be yeah. bypassed also. Yes, okay. we we are trying to utilize the farm bits as much we we could. Um, seeing like weather API, which is something which uh, Farmbase is still working on. They, it's not officially launched yet, but so we are trying to find it from the uh, third party and, and try to integrate to the farm bits for now. And later on, once the farm bits has their version readily available, then we can, we can replace it. Uh, so, uh, so the, the also one one small thing because we talk a lot about uh, farm beats. Uh, we're not getting any uh, any uh, money if you use farm beats. Huh? Let's be clear. Uh, the reason why we decided to use it is basically because for us it's a way to go faster. So we didn't have to redesign all the ETL, all the ingestion process, and so on. We could use what was already available, use the insights already available, use the graph which is already available, uh, and directly uh, I and our our data guy could look at the data which is available and then. Uh, make decision on how, what kind of model we're going to put in place and what kind of decision we can make, All right? Okay. Uh, so now uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about the device conflict. So it's, uh, it's something which is, uh, it's, 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 an, it's, I think it's an important learning uh, that we had during the during the lab. Um, so we all developers, right? So everybody uh, in the company, or most of the, the people in the company are actually developers, right? Uh, and we know how to code and so on. Uh, the thing is, if you look at development, yeah. So if you look at development, uh, the, the, the stack that we used to have for... for uh, uh, um, sorry, I'm going to... Uh, uh, so the stack that we used to have was something like this, right? You had your hardware. Then on top of that, you had the machine language, right? That, that was made by your assembler, your assembly language. And then you had the higher, higher level kind of language and we had C. So this is something that hopefully all the people, um, Punit, I know you want to, to say that you're very young, but I'm sure you remember this, um, that we had for, for software. Over the years, it has changed, right? We had uh, visual languages coming up on top of it, and still it was relatively well connected so you, 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 to the rest of your languages, to the rest of your stack. Today, it looks a bit more like this. So you have an extra layer, which is you have your, your virtual machine, your JVM. You have uh, potentially a real-time, uh, a runtime environment. You have your interpreter. You have uh, your bytecode. You have your, your Python layer, which is being executed. And what, what happens is that today, most of the developers are actually working here. Right, so they focus on the uh, the part which is uh, the JavaScript part, whether it's in Node or it's in uh, even it's in Python script to ingest data and so on. And your uh, your IoT devices are actually here. So in between, what do we have? We have a lot of libraries that are somewhere in there. We have some containerization somewhere. Uh, and we actually start to lose the contact between uh, the, the code that we're writing and the actual hardware that we need to talk to. And what it meant for us, it's something that we have, uh, that we have found, is that we had 
this kind of uh, idea. We had on one side our uh, our gateway and on the other side our, our devices and on the other side we had the switch and the communication was going this way. We, we send a message saying please switch on, got a feedback saying switched on, uh, we sent please switch off and we got a feedback that was switched off. Everything went fine. Now what we've seen happening actually at the uh, at the farm was something that looks a bit more like that. You had still your gateway and your um, and your uh, smart switch and we actually had device conflict and for us it means that we had a garbage uh, garbling of the of the common sent off so that we were trying to send two messages at the same time why because two uh, processes were trying were accessing actually and sending to the same device so they were both accessing the same device why because it's two separate process and the way that node was uh, was uh, using it was uh, as you know node is, is basically creating uh, separate threads for everything everything is asynchronous so you can run your stuff uh, and it's run by default in parallel and we had a problem in there and it took us a lot of time to notice it because it only happens in very specific scenarios we had because we didn't have a feedback from the switch we actually had to resend the same message over and over again and at certain points we had two messages being sent at the same time to the same gateway and that gave us this uh, this uh, garbling so what we did is uh, we try to fix it of course, right? Um, after uh, Norbert, I don't know if Norbert is on the line, complained a lot saying, well, uh, it doesn't work sometimes uh, and sometimes it does work and we don't understand why. Uh, we noticed that we had multiple threads accessing the same slash dev, so the same device. So we didn't see it immediately. We it took a lot of uh, thinking and, and postulating to see if it was going to, to, to be the reason why we had problem. So we did, well, what we can do when you are at a higher level, which is we try to use files. So files is, we, you write a file. I mean, everybody who's doing development knows about that. You write a file somewhere, you check if the file is present. If the file is present, uh, you're going to uh, not use the device. You wait for the file to be away before using the device, right? Everybody's been doing that. Apache has been doing that for years. They're creating a PID file and that's how they ensure that they have only one process running and they're not having conflict on the port, right? So uh, we try to do that using files. The problem is files are not semaphore. So the difference between a file and a semaphore is that you can actually do the two operations without being uh, 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 atomic operation. So checking if the file is present is one operation. Writing the file is just another operation. If you have two processes doing that at the same time, you're actually writing twice the same file. So you just overwrite the system is going to, to give you access and overwrite it. There's a way to go around that, that we didn't go for. We went for actually using semaphore. There's a way to go around that if you ever need it on Unix is to use directories. So if you use directories, uh, it's actually a way to behave almost like a semaphore, except that it's not an IPC. So you will not, uh, uh, you will not have the ability to see that through an IPCS check. But uh, if you use a directory, both operation check and write are done uh, at the same time. So you can, uh, when you do an MKDIR, you create your directory. If the directory already exists, it returns minus one. And you know that there's a, there's a, a directory which is present. So you can do both operations as an atomic operation. Uh, this is a way to go around creating a SEMA and actually having to use IPC. But this, this actually took us a lot of time. And the, the main reason is that we, we don't really think about that when you do development, you do development at higher levels. Um, so the, okay, so now I don't know what's happening. Uh, yeah, a few things that we want to talk about. It's actually the last, uh, the last two slides. So uh, we are surprisingly on time. We'll have time for Q&A. Uh, want, we want to talk a little bit about the pitfalls that we had over the past four months, five months uh, working on the on this IoT project um, so that you can potentially learn from, from the issues that we had. Uh, the first thing is that uh, Raspberry Pi is running an ARM processor, right? And you have to use ARM specific Docker images for that to function. So the pipeline that you have in place, okay, uh, the pipeline that you have in place for your, uh, for your compiling, if it's running on a non-ARM CPU with the same, actually the exact same uh, 
uh, chipset is not going to work. You need to do your compiling on another Pi. So we have a Pi, for example, only for compiling our code. The other thing is uh, you need uh, to build your own images for the, uh, the other softwares that you're going to use. So for us, we use CreateDB, right? We had to build our own Docker image specifically for CreateDB. The other thing is we've tried, uh, maybe you remember that we said at one point, we're going to use Pi Zero instead of Pi 4 to reduce the power consumption. Well, Pi Zero doesn't support Docker because it's running ARM 6 and the JDK that supports CreateDB starts with ARM 7. So we were not able to run, uh, to run Docker on the uh, Pi Zero and we had to revert back to a Pi 4. This is a funny one. Um, if you want to, to use a timer and you need timer because you need everything to be aligned, right? We had problem with the clock because the clock is usually updated using the internet. And if you don't have internet and you have uh, on top of that power issue, the clock start to deviate. So you, you start to have differences in uh, timestamp uh, for all your logs that you are creating and also for the data that you're ingesting afterwards in the cloud. And this can be an actual problem. So you need to, to, to uh, take care of that. Uh, you, you, the alternative methods that we found, there are two, uh, one that I really like, one that Jayesh really likes. So the one that I really like is to use satellite data. So you can use a satellite uh, uh, GPS actually to fetch the data from a GPS device. Uh, the other option, and it's less fun because it's not using a satellite, uh, it's, it's to use a battery. So you put a clock with a battery on it and you can uh, keep your, 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 your time like you would, you would with, uh, uh, with a watch basically. Uh, today, none of them are currently implemented. We are requesting from the hard for, for we are requesting the hardware to try it out and to be able to implement. But we still have this problem today. Um, the other alternative method that you could use if you have a GSM network uh, is that you can uh, check the time on the GSM network also. But for that, you need to have a device which is uh, directly connected to uh, the GSM network. So for us, it didn't work because we are using a Git uh, router for that. But if you're using meshing uh, on uh, Wi-Fi, or if you use LoRaWAN, you could actually use uh, the uh, time on the GSM network. Um, the other stuff is uh, if you are discussing with the uh, your, your your hardware provider and you're using smart switches, ask for smart switches with a feedback function. Okay, so what's the feedback function? Is you have the ability to send a message saying what's your current status and get back the answer which is I'm on or I'm off. Why? Because not all the messages are going to go through. So we had message loss, um, which might happen for multiple reasons, uh, which means that when you uh, send a message, you need to send that message over and over again to ensure that it's taken because you have no way to get the feedback from the router saying, I'm f I have actually done the switch uh, with to, to on or to off. So um, this was also one of the reasons why we had this problem with the, uh, with the uh, multiple uh, uh, threads accessing the same uh, device. So the solution for that is the next version of the switch that we uh, purchased to our uh, hardware provider, we said we want to have the option to get a feedback function. So we send a message and we get the feedback. If you do it, please do the same thing because we, we lost a lot of uh, time actually uh, finding work around for just the fact that we didn't have that function on the switch. Um, Docker image size, image size over unstable internet. Reduce the size of your Docker as much as possible. So if you need a, a day to download 100 megabytes because you're on a remote area, you need to find smaller size for your Docker images. You need to remove uh, the size, the, remove the, the, uh, the unused component inside your image uh, to make it smaller. And you should also use uh, split images as much as possible and different uh, layers in your Docker so that you can only download the latest layer for your changes and you don't have to read and load everything. So setting up your layers properly in your Docker is very, very important to not have a problem when you try to download it. Another one is the uh, binding of static IP on the router, not at the Pi level. Uh, the reason is if you have another device which is not, which does not have a static IP, for example, uh, you, in our case, it was uh, the tablet, uh, the tablet with the front end. Uh, it's possible that the IP is already going to be used by another device. The router try to reassign that IP and then you have a problem. So if you can, I pressed back for some reason. Uh, if you can uh, use the uh, the IP binding at the router level, you won't have that problem because the router knows to which device it has provided the, the IP. Um, 
Another one is uh, the physical restart may be needed. So Norbert will once again say it, uh, but we have problem like everybody. Uh, the, the regularly, we need to reboot the entire system, which means that we need to have somebody to actually plug, plug the, the device and then plug it back. Uh, the, the, the idea was to use a, a switch to make a call to that, uh, to that device and to restart it. The problem that we have is for that to function, you need to have a, some sort of smart switch and also a device somewhere which is sending um, a message to that smart switch to do the reboot. So if all your devices are not responding, you still need a human somewhere to press a button or to remove the, uh, the actual plug and then put it back. But having a smart switch and a way to do the restart uh, could be a good way. One of the reasons you could have a problem with your uh, Pi is sometimes you have a message that says that you have a tunnel corruption when you communicate with your LoRa gateway. Uh, this happens when you have too many messages which are sent or garbling, garbling messages uh, which, are, uh, which are being sent to the, to the gateway. You get the tunnel corruption message, which means you need to do a reboot of your device. Um, and one of the good things is if you want to do the same kind of uh, project and if you are falling into the license, the right type of license to use the community edition of CreateDB, uh, you can use CreateDB community edition because it supports any number of nodes. So you can actually use CreateDB and use it to do uh, the HA and your DR uh, using Create and using the community edition, which is free. Okay. Uh, so that's all for my slides. Uh, I know it was very technical uh, and, and going a bit in every direction. Uh, now we can go through the Q and A. Uh, there were a few questions asked in the in the group chat, but uh, I think Funit has already answered some of them for Aisha. Okay. Uh, so. Um, thanks so much, Dimitri, um, and Punit, and and. Um, and thanks so much for your presentations. Um, I think that's probably very helpful for all the teams to better understand the technologies available for them and, and you know, what are the challenges and how they can uh, circumvent these challenges. Um, I didn't see anyone ask any questions other than Aisha, which Puneet has already answered. But since everyone is also able to speak and, and um, show their screens, um, can I kindly request for everyone to um, start your videos and then um, feel free to speak now if you have any questions. Sorry, Esther is asking a question, Puneet. Uh, so the question is, is FarmBeats API compatible with other cloud providers? So the way to look at it is basically, there is, this is all about API in and API out, right? I mean, what are you uh, ingesting via FarmBeats? Uh, and FarmBeats actually provides you all the APIs back um, in terms of what you want to do with it. So whether you take it and, and integrate it with your existing solution or take it to the third party cloud, it, it's up to you, absolutely. But then the only thing is Palm Beats sits on, on a bunch of Azure services. So there is this piece where you'll have to ingest something into Palm Beats, process it, take it back, and, and that's some work that you'll need to do. Does that answer your question, Esther? Great. Thanks, Esther, for the question. Okay, Aisha has a question. She raised her hand. Aisha, please. Um, yeah, thank, thanks to everyone for the presentation. Um, I, I just uh, w wanted to... Um... Sorry, I think you went on mute accidentally. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're, building, <laughs> we're building our software on, um, on the Azure cloud, actually, uh, because we um, got credits from a Microsoft program. Um, is there any benefit, so for instance, the, the cloud service you're using to build a software platform, does that have an impact on, um, like, uh, does that have an impact in terms of uh, uh, using Microsoft for the software and also for the data, so using FarmBeats, does that improve the connectivity or there is no relation between both systems? So if I understand your question correct, you already are using Azure for uh, some other purpose right now. Um, and if you, if you have to use FarmBeats in parallel, does it kind of uh, help or affect your existing system? Uh, no, yes, it does exactly. not. So 
you can actually go ahead and spin off an instance of Palm Beats by creating a new resource group um, and without affecting whatever is other workloads you have on Azure today. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, Aisha. Any other questions from anyone? Don't be shy, feel free to ask anything. Okay, so we have a question from Mario. Um, how does the information get back to the farm? Do you need to connect the Azure Cloud slash Farm Beats? So Dimitri, yeah, we are, sorry, who wants to take that? No, no, Dimitri, you want to go and answer that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for us, uh, we are we are uh, fetching the data uh, back from the. We are connecting back to uh, the farm beats to get the data. Uh, how does it? Do? We actually go through a function, if I'm not wrong, uh, which is uh, pro we process the data on farm beats, and then once we have a good idea of whether or not we should uh, water, we are sending it back to the farm. We send only a small packet. Uh, so how it's going to work, very likely, because this part is not developed, is that the farm, the moment you have internet connection, is going to ping, uh, not farm bits, but another process, and say, do you have a packet for me? And this packet will be zipped. So it's going to be either via a blob, uh, or it's going to be via a file uh, somewhere. We're going to get that packet. And then from there, we're going to know uh, what the uh, machine learning algorithm has selected. So we are not connecting directly uh, to farm beads because we want to fetch something which is already compressed. Uh, for the, the same reason, we cannot uh, transfer too much uh, data on the, on the connection that we have. Just to add to that, uh, like Prabha mentioned, basically we've built a sample UI, which, is, which we call the accelerator. So uh, if you already have an existing uh, communication channel to, you know, when you're talking to farm, you could either integrate with that, or uh, you could use the APIs and quickly build, um, you know, something on top of it as well to make sure how do you want to push that information back to the farm. So the UI piece is absolutely optional. <clears throat> so the Raspberry Pis could also be used as the <clears throat> the devices on the farm that actually receives the information, displays it maybe in a user friendly form, etc. Yeah, so, so the, 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 the visualization on farm beats is, is very important, something that, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, Norbert can access, mm -hmm. but we need also to have that information on the, on the farm. Mm. So to, to, yeah. to keep you, because uh, keep in mind the project is continuing, right? So we continue to move, we're having, we're having discussion with the rest of the mm. team. The, the mm. last thing that we, that we said was maybe we should build a physical device. So uh, it, it was last week, I think we, we discussed that with Jayesh. We said we're going to make a device, a physical box. And on the box, we're going to have lights uh, because we need the, the, the guys at the farm to switch on the mm. pump. Right, because it's a, it's a, and Norbert is yeah. going to say if, uh, if I'm making any mistake, but it's a pump which is using uh, petrol, right? It's going to be a powerful one. And this pump, we need somebody to actually switch it on, okay? So yeah. uh, activate it. So we cannot like send a, a command to activate it. So <clears> what <throat> we're going to get is a button somewhere with a light that says switch on the pump. When it's done, the person <laughs> press the button and then it's going to communicate back to our, uh, to our device. Um, so this is a, like a completely different kind of UI. The physical UI, we're not really used to it, but uh, we're going to try. And we would like also that UI to allow bypassing the selection from the, uh, from the machine learning part, because we know that the, the, the system can make mistakes, right? So if mm. the uh, farmer says, actually, I want to water now, we want that possibility also. And using the tablet, we looked at different way of doing that, and it's going to be possible to do it from the UI, but doing it from a physical device could actually be also a good way to say, actually, we're going to start. And we can also send a feedback from there and say, there's too much wind, don't do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah, uh, we, the, the decision can be made at the farm by, by a human. So I don't know if, let me see if I can share that with you. Um, yeah, so just to add to that, it is very flexible that way, uh, Mario. You could do yeah. it in a, uh, in a completely automated manner. It could be semi-automated and it could be mm -hmm. manual as well, mm -hmm. right? So it could be a mix of that. So you have all the APIs available in terms of, if you already have an existing automated system, it can directly mm. talk to that. Mm. But then, like mm. Dimitri mentioned, sometimes you really want manual intervention. So, I mean, you could, mm. you could basically play the way you would want it. Mm. So, it, and the, the, I, the I, div yes. Hi, guys. Norga uh, speaking. I think if you, this requirement depends on the, the pump that you are going to use. For us, uh, 
for the project at the farm, we need quite a powerful pump. So most probably uh, we would need uh, one that we will uh, power with a uh, with, uh, gasoline or something like this. Uh, nevertheless, if your requirement is uh, uh, lesser than the one we have, you should be able to use a, a DC pump uh, or something, uh, something similar. I think it would really depend on your requirements. The, the, one of the one of the things that we discussed last time, uh, you know, about uh, finding bypasses. So the, the the last discussion that we had was what kind of uh, what kind of uh, valve are we going to look at? So we look at solenoid valve and a bunch of other mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we said we're going to use something like this, right? It's not very expensive, mm -hmm. going maybe to get cheaper than that. But the benefit is that you can actually mm -hmm. activate it manually. So if you want to activate it, no, nothing is working yeah, because this is going to happen at one point or another. Yeah. So nothing mm -hmm. is going to work, right? And everything is going to be down. Uh, the farmer can go and just move the move the valve and activate the water in the in the parcel that he wants. So at the end, uh, I mean, we're going to get information and so on. But the idea is really to make it so that if if the decision is made at different level and we have the ability to bypass any of these levels. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think what's nice as well is the possibility to uh, also track the, the other farming supplies. If you're talking about uh, diesel fuel and so on, the use of diesel fuel and so on, because uh, you now have uh, the farmer being involved in information analysis and decision-making cycle, which I think is quite good to actually adapt your software to their existing cycle of thinking about this. And then they can grow into this new way of making decisions. So I'm just thinking of from the user side, I'm, a, I'm an information systems guy. So I stand next to the user and I look at the system and say, how will it help me uh, to do my existing stuff better and also to include new innovations. But great guys. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Thanks for your question. Um, there's another question from Esther asking if farm beats, uh, farm visualization and soil analysis, does it operate globally? Yeah, so farm beats is uh, available on Azure Marketplace. So anybody in the world can go ahead and, and deploy it or install it. So it's available globally. And you will be able to use it the way, same way anyone else is using it. Yeah. Yeah, I would I think... like to. Yeah, I would like to add one point here. Uh, when we try to deploy form bits to the Palo network, so what we initially found is the the Singapore region is something which is not um, the traffic is huge, so we couldn't really deploy form form bits from the Singapore region. So what we did, we we looked out for the West US region and we got the um, farm bits installed within a few, few minutes. So that's why we, we have the flexibility to choose the region across the globe. So in, in case your region is not supported, still we have ways to um, find another region. The, the, w w one thing also, uh, because the question uh, from Mr. about the, the soil maps and, uh, and uh, the data that we are getting from the from visualization, what we noticed is it's not the same everywhere, right? I think Punit can also explain that, uh, but we're not getting the same kind of resolution and the same kind of data quality in every uh, in every place in the world. In Cambodia, specifically at the, f the place where Norbert Farm is, and I think he doesn't want to move. Uh, we have uh, we didn't have a high resolution stuff uh, from the satellite data, right? Right. So, like we mentioned, I mean, Prabha had it in his slide that we we rely on on Sentinel two for our satellite imagery. Um, so we have certain dependencies, uh, similarly for maps as well. Um, but then, typically, uh, most of the I mean, uh, I would say globe is kind of covered. It purely depends on who is providing that service. Um, there are some shortcomings in every service, uh, including farm beat. It could be Sentinel as well. Uh, but then uh, Sentinel is, is, is supposed to be one of the best uh, and open source as well. So we went with them. We are, we are working with other uh, you know, satellite image partners as well. So it's an ongoing journey. Uh, we we'll include as much as possible. That said, uh, it is always, uh, like we said, it is very extensible farm beaters. So if you're flying a drone, you could go ahead and, and you know, kind of ingest the orthomosaic directly onto farm beat if it's not uh, available. So you could use a consumer drone. Uh, you could use a, a, an, a, an enterprise drone or whatever, right? So uh, you have multiple ways to ingest that data. And sensors is purely, if you, 
So FarmBeats actually helps you ingest uh, historical data as well. It doesn't necessitate that you go ahead and invest in sensors, new sensors now. If you are using sensors already, you could basically uh, you know, kind of connect that with FarmBeats and uh, visualize the telemetry on, on the UI. Esther, does that answer your question? Which is, which is what we're doing, right? So the, the sensors that we yeah, have exactly. actually send it also as bulk data because of the same connect, internet connection uh, thingy. So we send bulk data and we send also historical data. And for the, for the overview, we're also going to take uh, a few pictures using drones and drones are also uh, very likely going to be part of the, of the final solution. So we, we, the idea here being that uh, one drone uh, can be used by multiple farms uh, in Cambodia so that the cost is not too high. Yeah, and drone drone as a service is also a new business case that is currently available. So, a lot of uh, startups are actually providing that service as well. Great, thanks all for your answers. I think that answers Esther's question, and thanks Esther for the question as well. Any other questions from anyone else? I guess not for now, but um, I'm just going to give a few minutes in case there's anything that comes to anyone's mind. I know it's probably a lot of information to take in, so um, it's all right if you don't have any questions at this point of time. If you have any questions afterwards that you would like to relate to any of the speakers, just let me know and I, I will uh, reach out to them. Um, if no one has any other further questions, then um, Dimitri, do you have anything else that you would like to add on or share? Uh, so no, not really. Uh, I had a, I had a slide uh, about the, uh, the 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 Laura part, but uh, I have actually a question for everybody uh, in in the the group here. Is there anybody using Laura at the moment uh, for your IoT device? Um, yeah, I'm working on a Laura project for actually the UNDP Hackster IO project. And you're using LoRa, LoRa one? Uh, yes, yes. W which one? <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> I'm using uh, LoRa one. Okay, so you, you yeah. with the internet gateways and uh, and everything. Yes, yes. So I'm using uh, the the main board is actually an Adafruit uh, Feather with a LoRa radio on it, and then um, yeah, helping to build uh, an Arduino based gateway. As well, that was the reason I asked the question in our last meeting about whether what you know whether you're using Raspberry Pis as your uh, LoRaWAN gateway. Understood. Literally, right here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in the board. Cool. <laughs> Very good. A anybody else using uh, LoRa? No. So, what what kind of uh, what kind of protocol are you using in your in your project? Are you going for Wi-Fi or something else or long range? No, no answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I guess everyone is shy. Sorry, I just uh, I just mentioned in the chat that I've been living with Laura for about uh, four years now mm -hmm. because uh, at my home there's uh, there's a, a Laura. <laughs> yeah, it's a node and a gateway. And my son has been studying the long range performance uh, in a real life situation where the signals are going across a major city with interference and varying weather patterns and adjusting all the protocol parameters. So I was quite familiar with the spreading factors and the, the, the data packages and sort of the load, you know, how much load can you put in? And uh, it was quite interesting doing long term statistics on that and to see what the interactions are between these. And he's continuing it now with uh, simulation work. Uh, using an open source simulation package and after a month he finally got his simulation results to correspond to other simulations so now you know he's, he's at 11 terms and therefore you can then direct your experimental work based on the simulations and vice versa to validate some of the things under various circumstances so that's really at the low level but it's important in terms of as you said the collisions you get uh, at the gateways and so on and how to um, optimize that if you've got a lot of sensors and I'm talking here about um, Let's say you've got 20 centers, sensors talking to a gateway at once. And uh, locally, our major application is in, in um, water reticulation systems because you'd like to know about bursts before they happen. Mm -hmm. And so 
all moisture sensors uh, in critical places can save you a lot of money. And so that's kind of a, a urban need that is uh, everywhere we have 30 year old infrastructure. But anyway. Interesting. So interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Dimitri. Do you, do you have any other things you'd like to discuss with the teams? Uh, no, I don't think so so if there's a so as, as uh, we said right if there's anything that you that you need any questions or anything like that don't hesitate uh, we're all available so there's a uh, yeah the, the, the contact information will be given afterwards right I, yeah. I, I just had a point I mean I just wanted to uh, respond to Mario I could as like I was on mute sorry uh, to his earlier point in other words, he mentioned about using uh, sensors and uh, so, I mean, uh, we also have, a farm beef also has a, a model. We've actually built a model that helps to, to you know, plot the sensors uh, within a farm as well. So it, it has a sensor placement map. Um, so that is something that, you know, is also very helpful. We've seen uh, from our research and our engagement today. Uh, typically that has been, traditionally it has been a mathematical calculation saying uh, X area divided by Y number of sensors. Um, but then uh, that's not how the soil is across the entire farm. So uh, we've also built, so when you when you go use farm beats, we kind of help you not just identify where should you be placing your sensors, but also stack rank them. So for instance, if you need only, uh, if uh, for whatever reason you want to buy only five sensors or, or install only five, and when the farm beat solution says you need 17, uh, it stack ranks them so that you could go ahead and take the top five. Um, and then plot them where, where it indicates. So that's another model that we've built. Thanks for that, Puneet. Um, uh, I, I think that's one more comment that someone made on the chat. Right. Yeah, so it's regarding open source is the code. So yes, uh, the code will be open source. The goal is to make it open source once we have a proper code. Uh, so we're going to open source it. It's going to be available. And if you want, uh, once it's available, I'll, uh, I'll share it. The thing is uh, making open source code, we, we know is more difficult than making uh, than making closed source. So, but it will be open source. So, and uh, Norbert will confirm, but the data that we're also going to get uh, it's also going to be open, so that you, you, we will get uh, open data for the for the weather. It's going to be available uh, once we have it, because we're still doing the setup, and you know there's a virus somewhere, so it's difficult to move. Um, and uh, we we want to make that available to everybody. And maybe later, uh, if we have information like growth and so on, it's something that if Norbert wants to share, uh, we're also going to make uh, to make available. But definitely, the weather forecast, uh, the weather data is also going to be open data, and the uh, and the um, uh, source code is also going to be open source at one point. Yes. Then we will share all the data from the farm as well. Great. Thanks, Dimitri. Thanks, Norbert. Um, Renzi, I hope that clarifies. So, um, if no one has any other questions, then I guess we can end this webinar. Thanks so much to the speakers for, for the presentations today. Um, I, think, I think it was really insightful and, and I'm very happy to see that there's great reception for these webinars. So um, if I guess also to everyone who attended today, if there's something that you're also interested in further exploring in a future webinar, just let us know. Maybe we can uh, organize another webinar together with the Palo IT team and the Microsoft Palm Beach team to see what else we can explore as well.